welcome to our continuing stories about Pensacola, Pensacola, Florida, North America's first place city and the, the city of five flags. And in recent episodes, we've been talking about Pensacola's rule in World War I. And then more, even more recently, we've begun to talk about the treaties, the signing of treaties, preparation of treaties that went on after World War I and, of course, which led to great trouble thereafter. In our first episode on treaties, we talked about our, how our president, Woodrow Wilson, with his friend Edward House, had gone to, uh, to Europe to negotiate, negotiating with the uh, representatives of England, France, and, or, and Italy, and how Mr. Wilson ran into trouble almost at once because he, he, earlier he had issued his famous 14 points, an effort to, to get a fair representation of, of uh, affairs between all of the countries. And when they got together with the Mr. Orlando, Mr. Clemenceau, and Mr. Lloyd George, uh, the, the others, they just didn't agree at all. So they went through the entire episode of writing the first elements of the treaty, and Mr. Wilson had to retreat from point after point after point that he had hoped to gain, and he gave up in each case because he wanted to preserve the League of Nations. He felt that this was so important to create an organization that which in the future would help uh, take care of disputes coming between nations. Mr. Wilson uh, worked hard, but he failed. And so his decision was, all right, I, I didn't succeed on what I wanted to do on the boundaries and navigation and things of that kind, but I will come home to the United States and I will make sure that our country becomes part of the League of Nations. So he came back and sat down with the representatives of the Senate. And of course, the Senate, this was going to be a, a, a national treaty, and the Senate had to approve that treaty. And he quickly found out that there were serious divisions among the senators. Some, a few of them were very much in favor of the idea. Some of them were sort of moderate. They were kind of in the, in the middle. They weren't quite sure which way they wanted to go, but a sizable number were what they called the Eric, Eric, oh, I'll get that word right. They just wouldn't agree to anything. And this was Senator Hiram Johnson, Senator Boros, Senator La Follette. They were dead set against having us in the United Nations. Uh, correction, the League of Nations, because basically they felt that we were giving away some of our sovereign rights in our, of our own. We were giving away the right to defend our, our points of view on an individual basis. And they didn't like that. So Mr. Wilson said, well, all right, if we're going to, if we're going to have a, a uh, membership in the League of Nations, then I've got to sell it to the people. And so he went together with his wife, who was, his, by the way, his second wife, a very faithful wife. They set out on a tour across the United States, a little bit like Harry Truman had to do in, the, in 1948 when he ran for president in a difficult time. They got on a special train and started west. And they went from city to city to city, each place giving speeches. And over the time, they gave, Mr. Wilson gave a total of 37 speeches, talked to huge numbers of people, and it was a big question of whether he really, really sold anybody on the idea. Well, at the end of the 37th speech, he, he sort of collapsed. Whether it was, uh, whether it was a stroke or not, where, where history really doesn't tell us firmly. But anyway, they had to stop. And so the train turned around and came back, and Mr. Wilson went into the, into the White House with his wife caring for him. And at this point in time, there was no arrangement in the Constitution for the vice president to step forward in a situation where the president was incapacitated. So as history tells it, over these next months, Mrs. Wilson actually was doing a lot of the work that represented the, the, the position of the president. Well, they, they, they talked, they worked, and as it turned out, Ultimately, the, the men who were dead set against the, the League in the, uh, in the, in the Senate, they, they prevailed. They did not, they would not, the senators would not come to a vote that was positive. So the United States just backed off. This one, well, of course, they, they did this politically in a very wise way. They said, OK, uh, maybe we aren't the ones that should make the final decision. Uh, we've got an election coming up very shortly, election for president. And we'll, th th because Mr. Wilson was not, will not be in office then, we'll let the next president make the decision himself. And so the, the election was held. And they, this time, instead of a Democrat winning, um, Warren Harding, the, uh, the Republican, became the next president. And Mr. Harding looked at the idea of the League of Nations. He also looked at the Senate and saw that he wasn't going to make a whole lot of friends if he plunged forward and demanded uh, action on this. So he sort of backed off and basically nothing ever happened as far as the United States. We said we did not become a part 
of the League of Nations. So now, after fighting in World War, World War I, the United States did not prevail on any of the points that they wanted in terms of boundary settlements, reparations, all of the things that we, we, we had gone into the treaty uh, uh, discussions on. We lost. We didn't, we didn't gain a single one of the points, and we did not join the League of Nations. Now, the rest of, rest of the, much of the rest of the world did put the League of Nations together. And it, since that's long ago, and let's just, re just remind our, our, all of us to, uh, right now that what the League was all about. So basically what they did, this was to, for, to create a, a large organized body for discussion of any disputes that came along. And all w nations that wished to belong to the League of Nations could. And the, this ex had two exclusions, Germany and Austria, which of course had been the uh, the enemy in World War One, uh, they were not allowed to enter the league. So we, we put this together, and the the, the, the so-called General Assembly had all of these members, and it had a kind of an executive body that included the four largest powers within it, plus four other countries that the, uh, the entire league would decide on. They these would be in a in a sort of a rotating basis. The, the General Assembly would meet once every three months in the League headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. And this began to work. Of course, there was no arrangement within the League itself for an army or any point of power that the League might uh, wish to use if some uh, difficulty was coming along. So that was part number one. <clears throat> Secondly, <clears throat> Beyond that, we, we had a, the second part of it, of course, was, was basically a, a, what they called a council. <clears throat> now, the council was the, an organization that pretty much took care of day-to-day -day things. They, they, they received the requests, the, the, uh, the hearings, and the council could be called to order at almost any time. Then part three was the, the, the administration. This was uh, the paid staff. These people work were in, once again, they were in Geneva, in Switzerland, and the League started its work early on in 1922, and it was there and, of course, was a part of, the, part of European and, and world uh, activity up until the beginning of World War II. Now, <clears throat> when we came, when, when we stop at that point, we have to take a look at what finally came out of the of the treaty signing. When, when the uh, we look at parts of the uh, of the world that had not been firmly settled by individual treaties, and that basically that was the Middle East. Now, in our, pre our previous uh, sessions, we talked about some of the things that had happened early in World War I. Number one, the, the, a, a representative of the Jewish community, G.M. Weitzman, had gone to uh, Lord Balfour, the prime minister at that time in England, and offered to give the English a special chemical formula that Weitzman had developed that was essential for the, for the manufacturing of gunpowder. And in exchange, Balfour gave Mr. Weitzman a, a, an affirmation that when the war was over, the English would back the big creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. This was known as the Balfour Declaration, and this was a pledge that the English had made to the Jewish people. At the same time, also in the Middle East, an English officer had organized quite a number of the Arabian leadership uh, and these were men who were uh, tribal leaders, if we, I guess we could be the right, best way to call it. And these men were anxious to separate their particular territories from under the yoke of the, of the sultan, the, the uh, uh, sultan of, that had operated out of Turkey. And they wanted to have individual countries. And this would occur in places like Syria, Iraq, Iran, Egypt. This is, these, these were to be separated out and would then, be, if, if the agreement was made, they would operate on their own. This was, the, this was what T.E. Lawrence, who was battling to, to help these people and create this, them, the Arabian peoples as a bloc working against the Turks, they had put this together and Lawrence had got the agreement that when the, when the war was over, the area of Palestine was going to be set up as an Arabian state and there would be Arabian uh, leaders put in all of the other uh, elements as well. Well, the, none of these points were satisfied in the actual treaty work that had been done at Versailles between the three great powers and Wilson. None of them were settled. And so now the, it came down to basically to the, to the League of Nations making some decisions. And what they did was to decide we, we aren't going to abide by any of those agreements. We'll throw them all out. We will, instead of that, we're going to, we're going to appoint, appoint, create what we call mandates. We're going to turn the, the government of, in each of those states over to one of the great powers, one of the successful powers in the war, and they're going to run them under a mandate that would be governed in, as an override by the League of Nations itself. They, they called, one was a, called a, a Class A 
mandate, and that meant that the the, the country in in, uh, in question probably might become free to become a democracy within one or two years. That was a class A mandate. Class B was well, one of the great powers will supervise the uh, the organization and, ha and handling of the uh, of the country indefinitely. And so they they sat down and made their the, within the league they made these decisions. Great Britain now was to going to have a class A mandate for Iraq, which meant, of course, that hopefully within a couple of years, Iraq would become an independent country. Number two, the, all of the, you know, the other areas, Syria was to become a mandate of France, but it was to be a class B mandate. This was kind of open end. They weren't sure when this might have a, may become a, a dem democratic operation itself. The other, other countries, particularly Palestine, now all went to Great Britain as, again, class B mandate. So the British now were going to literally run Palestine. They had pushed aside the agreement that had been made with the GM Weizmann, and that was just basically uh, ignored. The only thing the British agreed that they would do was at least in the, in the near term, they would open the door for immigration of Jewish people coming from other countries to come into Palestine itself, and that did carry forward for the next almost 15 years. Uh, Syria became a Class B mandate under the French flag and continued on that way for a great many years. Egypt was somewhat different. They weren't sure, quite sure what to do with Egypt. So they, they said, well, we, well, we won't call it a Class A, we won't call it a Class B, but we'll let the British help try to put together something that would be a modern mo a monarchy, some, like, something oh, a little bit like the British had themselves with a, a parliament and a king. And so they worked in that direction step by step. Well, that was basically what, what, they, what they did. This settled down. These, all these mandates now were under the umbrella of the League of Nations itself. Now, how were they going to manage it? Well, this was, this was new territory for all of these people. So basically, the British moved into Palestine and Iraq and Iran and in, 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 in a supervisory way in Egypt. The French moved into Syria, and that's where things settled. Now, you can see now, at this point, the Jewish people who were hoping to emigrate and create their own, own country in Palestine, they were very unhappy with the basics of it. Uh, the people with the, Ara the Arabic leadership, a men that had come out of the tribal leadership that had hoped to have their own countries under their own guidance, now they were disappointed. So basically, that's the way things hung out as we looked at 1922-23, when all of these mandates were put in place. Now, here in this, in our current century, if we look back on what happened then, you can see that the, there were a whole lot of people who were very unhappy with what had been set up in the Middle East. It set the road for more for, for people to be to look for ways to, uh, to 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 try and come back and get what they had originally hoped to get in the uh, in, in the beginning of World War One. The one place that did turn out differently, went fairly well, was Turkey. Turkey, which of course had been the headquarters of the Sultan, uh, this became a republic uh, mainly because of the hard work of a former soldier named Mustafa Kemal. And Turkey successfully became a, a republic and did so and, and, and carries on, of course, uh, as it is in the, in the time as we talk, make this little program put together right now. So basically, when we look at the problems that the world faces in the 21st century in the Middle East, we can look back and see if, if Mr. Wilson had survived and had gotten his points across, perhaps things would have been different there. Perhaps they would have been different also in Germany. They might have been different in some of the other countries where, where difficulties lie. But nonetheless, that what Mr. Wilson did not prevail. And of course, the United States was not part of the League of Nations. So we sat back and watched as a nation, we sat back and watched what the, what the sort of things that did happen. And we watched as beginning in the early 1930s, things began to go bad because of the depression. So there we were, the table had been set for another world war, and that pretty much is the way things happen because of the actions there in the treaty.